שלום לכולם, אתם... Hello everybody, please do take your seats. I learned my lesson and I drank some water in the pores, but I want to tell you what I ate. So we are now continuing. We'll now have a lecture in English on the issue of uh, inequality in health at a local level. The role of neighborhood environments, uh, Dr. Laurentier Mackenbach. It's going to be from the Amsterdam UMC. It's going to be in English. So if you need interpreting, please do take earphones and think about any questions you may have. Whoever is listening on Zoom, yes, please do send us questions if you queries, if you have any. The keynote lecture will be about inequality in health at local level and the role of neighborhoods and environments by Dr. Jurenta Mackenbach. Dr. Mackenbach is assistant professor at the Amsterdam Public Health Research Institute at the Amsterdam UMC in Amsterdam. Dr. Mackenbach special, spe specializes in interdisciplinary research into food environments and how they affect lifestyle behaviors and chronic diseases and the socioeconomic inequalities. She is the co-founder of the Upstream team and associate editor of Health in Place. You're welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for these kind introductions. Um, and it's really an honor to be here at this very interesting conference. I'm really glad to be here today. Um, before I start, I would like to declare that I have no conflict of interest for my research or this presentation. Um, and these are really the take home messages that I would like to convey during um, this lecture today. So first, the local context or neighborhood environment um, can worsen or decrease health inequalities. The positive side is that environmental interventions, such as at the neighborhood level, are more equitable than individual level interventions. However, to sustainably create um, healthier living environments, we may need a systems approach to understand the drivers in the wider system that determine what our living environments look like. And also, there are limits to what you can do at the local level to reduce health inequalities. Before I dive into the underpinning of these key messages, I would like to explain my perspective on health promotion and health inequalities. I'm co-founder of the Upstream team, um, which is an international network um, that focuses on the upstream determinants of health and disease. And the idea of upstream determinants comes from an old tale that I would like to share with you. The tale is about three fishermen that sit at the shore of a large river. And they're sitting at the end of the stream, so downstream, because all the fish then swim towards them. And the three fishermen happen to be medical doctors. So they're enjoying their fishing day until they see a child drowning in the river. Of course, they jump into the water and they manage to save the child, luckily. But once they're back at the shore, they see another child. They immediately jump back in and save the child. But then they see another child and another, and the medical doctors become really inventive. One makes a raft so that he can save two children at the same time. Another uses a rod to reach the children on the other side of the river. But the third fisherman walks out of the uh, river and walks upstream. And the other two scream to, to her, what are you going to do? We need to save those, those children. But the third one says, no, I'm going to look who or what is actually um, pushing those children into the river. And that is the idea of upstream thinking. Um, searching for the causes of disease and mortality beyond individual level risk factors. A bit like Jon Snow, who discovered that contaminated water was the source of a cholera outbreak in London. So let me start with my own local context. This is my hometown, Rotterdam, in the Netherlands. And it's the River Maas that you see flowing through the city. 
I've been born and bred here, and it's really a wonderful city. It's the second largest city of the Netherlands, with around 800,000 inhabitants. It's also Europe's largest seaport. Um, and because the city centre was largely destroyed during the Second World War, the city mostly consists of very mod modern architectural buildings and bridges. And the bridge on the photo actually connects the north and the south side of the city, which are divided through the River Maas. And this is a map of the metro connections in, Rotter in, in the Rotterdam area. And we really have a fantastic infrastructure of public transportation. So this map is just showing metro lines and metro stops, but we also have trains, trams, buses, and a light rail. But the reason I'm showing this picture is not because of our fantastic public transportation system, but because of the health inequalities in Rotterdam that I can explain based on this map. The north side of, the of Rotterdam is typically much healthier than the south side of the city. For example, in Hoek van Holland and Hilligersberg, people generally have a high life expectancy and more than 70% of life is typically spent in good health. In southern neighborhoods such as Feyenoord and Charlos, the life expectancy is a couple of years lower and the percentage of life spent in good health is lower as well. This map shows the prevalence of children born with a low birth weight, which is a risk factor for the development of diseases later in life. And the risk is lower in the north side of Rotterdam and higher in the south side of the city. Inhabitants in the north side of the city have more expensive houses, higher income levels, more wealth, and higher education levels than inhabitants in the south of Rotterdam. So the red dots in this map indicate small-scale areas where the average housing price is more than a million euros. That's equal to a million dollars, US dollars at the moment. Whereas the average housing price in the Netherlands in 2020 was 390,000 um, euros. And you see that the red dots are mostly concentrated above the river, so in the north of Rotterdam. So what does the north and south side of Rotterdam look like? The upper picture is an area in Kralingen in the north side. It's calm, it's green, and it has large and expensive houses. The lower picture is an area in Charlos in the south side. It's gray, not very well maintained, there's a lot of graffiti, and it's much less safe. It only seems natural that living in the north side of Rotterdam is better for your physical and mental health than living or growing up in the south side. But it's not just the maintenance and the urban design of neighborhoods. What resources are available also differs between local areas. And this table comes from a study I did with colleagues in Rotterdam, where we assessed how the local food environment changed over time. We distinguished between different types of food retailers and calculated percentage change over time. Most pronounced is the sharp decrease in local fresh food stores, such as bakeries, butchers, and greengrocers. But also the increase in lunchrooms. And I should say that the majority of food retailers classified as lunchrooms sell predominantly unhealthy foods and unhealthy portions. So this is really not a favorable development. However, if we distinguish between the more and less deprived areas of Rotterdam, we see a different pattern emerging. In the previous slide, it looked like restaurants and fast food restaurants only slightly increased over time. But in fact, we see a very large increase in fast food restaurants and restaurants in the more deprived areas and a more modest increase in the richer areas. While the increase in lunchrooms is actually driven by increases in the richer areas in Rotterdam. And these findings highlight that the inhabitants in the poorer areas of Rotterdam have an unhealthier food environment than inhabitants in the richer areas. Of course, these local inequalities are not unique to Rotterdam or the Netherlands. In the European Spotlight Project, we examined the neighborhood level determinants of unhealthy lifestyle and obesity. We sampled residents from neighborhoods with a higher and lower socioeconomic status and with higher and lower residential area density, population density. And in the first exploration, we tested whether individuals living in 
um, more deprived, lower SES neighborhoods and lower population density neighborhoods had a higher body mass index than inhabitants of high SES and high population density areas. Indeed, we saw that individuals in the low socioeconomic status neighborhoods had higher body mass index. Um, we did not see the same for low population density. And in a follow-up analysis, we found that the explanations for this pattern, so for the um, relation between neighborhood SES and body mass index, was through transport-related physical activity behaviors, leisure time physical activity behaviors, and vegetable intake. In a different analysis of this European Spotlight study, we investigated how na different neighborhood characteristics cluster together. And we found four distinct clusters um, across urban areas in, in London, Paris, Budapest, uh, Ghent, and the Randstad in the Netherlands. And the cluster most dominant in the lower SES areas was high residential density with low aesthetics, while the richer areas, the inhabitants of richer areas, were more likely to live in green areas with a low population density or areas with many food and recreational facilities, which is more favorable. Based on the research on neighborhoods and health from the last decades, there are generally three explanations for health inequalities at the neighborhood level. Either it's due to the characteristics of the people living in those neighborhoods, so that's a um, compositional explanation, or it's due to the um, resources and um, uh, characteristics of the neighborhoods themselves, that's a contextual explanation, or the combination of both. And of course, it's the combination of both. For instance, this study led by Anna Ribeiro, um, and it, the study is from the Life Path Project, demonstrated that the relative um, risk of all-cause mortality in the most versus least deprived areas was 1.3 for those with a low education level and 1.1 for those with a high education level. And this confirms this interaction between both contextual and compositional effects of the neighborhood. But of course, it leaves the question of what aspects of neighborhood environments contribute to health inequalities. So my colleague Niem Kold and Braver systematically reviewed the evidence for associations between the built environment and type 2 diabetes. And she found that living in more urbanized areas was associated with higher diabetes risk although this was mostly the case for low- and middle-income countries. And living in more walkable and greener areas was associated with a lower diabetes risk. It makes sense that good local infrastructure, including good access to healthcare, healthy food, and walkability, contributes to better health. Amsterdam is known as the cycling capital of the world. And this is often attributed to our cycling culture. We cycle in the rain, when we go on holidays, when we do our groceries, and we cycle from a very young age. But the cycling culture in the Netherlands also started with bold policies around good cycling infrastructure. In the 1970s, Amsterdam was still very car dominated. However, since then, a lot has been invested in good infrastructure, including separate cycle lanes and street lighting. And actually, all over the world, we've seen um, changes in infrastructure and built environment that are favorable for physical activity and health. So this is Vilnius in the Baltic States, but this is an example from Paris in France, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Vienna in Austria. And these examples um, show that infrastructure can make it easy to be physically active or take the bike to work. And sometimes the method is to make active transportation attractive. And sometimes it's through making it more difficult or more expensive to take the car. For instance, in this study that we conducted in Wellington, New Zealand, we found that it's important to encourage active transport and discourage car use at the same time. For instance, by making parking both at the residential uh, area and the destination, for example, in um, uh, work-related areas, 
um, more expensive and at the same time increasing the bus and other tra public transportation frequencies. But it's not just about infrastructure and the built environment. It's also about social relations, social norms, air pollution, light pollution, noise pollution, protection from the sun, exposure to marketing for unhealthy products, just to name a few examples. This US study demonstrated that non-Hispanic whites generally have a lower than state average exposure to air pollution, while non-Hispanic blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and minority groups have consistently higher than state average exposures to air pollution. And these findings are comparable to our own publication in the making, where we saw that non-Dutch ethnic minorities consistently have higher air pollution exposure even after adjustment for individual level socioeconomic status. And this article in the New York Times highlight the inequalities in protection from the sun. Now that citizens all over the world are increasingly exposed to heat waves, shade becomes increasingly important. Indeed, low income areas in some urbanized um, areas have 30% less tree, tree coverage and a four degrees Celsius hotter temperature than their higher income neighborhood counterparts. And there's also evidence for the unequal distribution of marketing for unhealthy products, um, such as junk food, alcohol, tobacco. And this means that the marketing for unhealthy commodities is more prevalent in more vulnerable communities, increasing even further their risk of unhealthy lifestyles and disease. But how do all those neighborhood characteristics get under the skin? Um, in this framework, I present some of the pathways through which neighborhoods affect health outcomes and the inequalities therein. So neighborhood social and physical characteristics and the resources in neighborhoods may affect health behaviors such as exercising and alcohol consumption. But neighborhood um, characteristics may also lead to stress, for example, due to unsafety or lack of adequate resources. Lack of access to healthcare services in the neighborhood may also lead to delayed or inadequate healthcare usage. And these three factors influence each other, but may also lead to biological responses, such as inflammation and unhealthy cholesterol levels, which in turn affect the risk of um, disease and mortality. In this study, the authors mapped the different pathways through which neighborhood crime levels may affect mental health outcomes. It's a complex web of interacting factors, but I listed some of the pathways um, on this slide. So higher neighborhood crime levels, firstly, directly affects individual crime risk. And if individuals experience crime themselves, they may become anxious or depressed. Hearing or seeing about crime in a neighborhood may also lead to fear of crime, which affects mental health as well. Knowing about crime in a neighborhood may lead to avoidance behaviors, such as not going out to, for walks, not taking the bike, not visiting a park, etc. But it may also lead to avoiding social contacts, leading to a lack of social resources. And all these factors may contribute to a lack of exercise, more smoking, unhealthier food consumption, and alcohol and drug use, which in turn affects both mental and physical health. But now that we have some sense of how neighborhood characteristics contribute to health inequalities, the question arises how these neighborhoods' environments can be changed so that they are better for health and reduce health inequalities. The advantage of contextual or environmental or neighborhood level interventions is that they require less agency from the receiver, receivers of the interventions. Instead of the receivers having to actively engage with the intervention to benefit from it, environmental interventions create structures that make it possible or, or even easier to make healthy choices. Because such interventions are then part of the structures the environment in which people make choices, they also tend to reach populations that are otherwise hard to reach for individual level interventions. So what do I mean by low agency interventions? 
Agency refers to the personal resources individuals have. So a high agency inter intervention is an intervention that requires a number of personal resources in order to benefit from the intervention. While with a low agency intervention, individuals require no or very few personal resources to benefit. For instance, think about folic acid supplementation for women trying to conceive. One type of intervention is to having information leaflets for women available. However, this requires women to first of all have access to a location where the leaflets are available. It requires them to be able to read and understand these leaflets. They have to have access to a pharmacy where they can get the folic acid supplement, supplements. They have to be able to pay for these supplements and they have to have discipline, time and other personal resources to take the supplements on a daily basis. Quite a lot could go wrong here because a high level of agency is required to benefit from the intervention. Another type of intervention is to add folic acid to wheat flour. All women who normally purchase wheat flour will now be exposed to folic acid supplementation, reaching many more women and requiring almost no effort of the receivers. I will now discuss some examples of studies which assess the impact of environmental changes on behavioral and health outcomes. First, the case of Pittsburgh, which was initially defined as a food desert because there was no close access to food stores that sold fresh and healthy foods and beverages. So a new supermarket was built in one of the Pittsburgh neighborhoods and researchers evaluated the impact of this new supermarket on the healthiness of food consumption and overweight and obesity rates. After 12 months of follow-up, individuals living around the new supermarket improved some of their food consumption behaviors, such as energy intake, but they did not increase purchase and intake of fresh food, such as fruit and vegetables, and they did not lose any weight. Another example is the evaluation of the Urban 40 study in the Netherlands. The overall goal of this program was to reduce health inequalities in the Netherlands by improving the living conditions in the 40 most deprived neighborhoods. Each of the districts implemented a range of interventions, and although the number and combination of interventions differed between districts, many of them received programs to prevent school dropouts, new playgrounds, uh, improved green spaces, more activities to improve social cohesion, um, houses were renovated to improve living conditions, but unfortunately, the researchers found no effects of the regeneration program on behavioral or health outcomes. Obviously, this was disappointing and led to many discussions, and one of the explanations um, for this disappointing finding is that because the neighborhoods were regenerated, the neighborhoods increased in value, which meant that the housing prices increased in value and the original, original, relatively poor inhabitants were no longer able to afford to live in these neighborhoods. But I must say this selective mobility was, we were unable to demonstrate that in the statistical analysis. But improving living conditions certainly has a range, broad range of benefits. In this cluster randomized trial led by Philippa Houden Chapman from New Zealand, the intervention group received free insulation at a number of places in their house. After 12 months, the intervention participants had better self-rated health, less wheezing, less days off school and work, and less visits to healthcare facilities. And although housing insulation obviously does not address poverty on itself, perhaps it's a more feasible and affordable intervention to improve living conditions than to increase wages. Of course, the benefits uh, of better insulation are likely to be much less, uh, much lower than countries that already have a better housing standard than uh, in New Zealand. Other studies have examined the impact of better transport infrastructure, such as the commuting and health in Cambridge study. The researchers evaluated the impact of a new guided busway that together with a protected cycle path was completely separated from other traffic. Participants who lived close, close to the uh, guided busway were more likely to spend at least part of their commuting route by foot or by bike, 
and they were less likely to conduct their whole commuting route by car, indicating some effects. And also, those living close to the guided busway um, generally increased their weekly cycling minutes. A number of studies have also investigated the uh, introduction of a new light rail in an, an area. But I must say those studies were mostly conducted in the US where public transportation, especially outside the city centers, is relatively sparse. But based on a systematic review and meta-analysis, it seems that individuals living close to the new light rail typically start using the light rail and thereby have to walk or cycle more to get to the first station. However, there's also some indication that this increased transport-related physical activity is then compensated by less leisure time physical activity. Apart from improving neighborhoods and their resources, another opportunity is to reduce the level of deprivation that individuals are exposed to. The Moving to Opportunity study from the US was a major social experiment. Families with children living in deprived areas were randomized to either receive a housing voucher to move to a low poverty neighborhood, a voucher to move to any neighborhood, or to a control group. And receiving a voucher, but especially receiving a voucher to move to a low poverty neighborhood, had major effects on the health and well-being of the adults and children in the families. So adults who received a housing voucher had a lower prevalence of obesity and type 2 diabetes experienced fewer um, physical limitations and had improved mental health. Children from those families had increased rates of college attendance and higher incomes when they started to work. But not all effects were favorable, as the effects in children, especially boys aged 18 and over, uh, 13 and over, were null or sometimes even negative. And this may be because the move on itself, moving to a different area, is an impactful event that, especially during uh, puberty, may have adverse effects. But also, the older children obviously had been exposed to the new, improved neighborhoods for a shorter duration, so they may not have benefited as much um, before they had to choose their education and, and started working. However, overall, um, it definitely seems that helping families to move out from areas with high poverty rates is beneficial. But apart from this very expensive experiment, there are very few opportunities to randomly allocate citizens to areas with higher and lower deprivation areas. One exception is the um, study of refugees arriving in Sweden. During some time three decades ago, the Swedish immigration officers randomly allocated new refugees to different areas in Sweden. And this allowed for an evaluation of what happened to the health of the refugees assigned to areas with higher and lower deprivation. So first, the researchers found that refugees assigned to high deprivation areas had a higher diabetes risk five years later. But second, the researchers found that the exposure, effect of exposure to deprived areas accumulated over time. So some refugees decided to move after a while, while others stuck to the place they were assigned to. And refugees who were exposed to high deprivation throughout the five years of follow-up had a higher diabetes risk than those exposed for a shorter duration. Unfortunately, while theoretically plausible, there is very little empirical evidence to support the hypothesis that neighborhood level or environmental level interventions are more equitable or even reduce socioeconomic inequalities more effectively than individual level interventions. And on this slide, I'm quoting a couple of um, recent systematic reviews which highlight the lack of evidence. And this is really a major gap in the literature that should be addressed. The examples of neighborhood interventions and their effects and the lack of evidence on the equity impact of environmental interventions point to the complexity of the links between resources and circumstances at the local level and the behaviors of individuals living there. As mentioned, individuals may respond as intended to a new light rail by starting using it and walking to the station, but they may substitute this behavior um, uh, with, for example, their leisure time physical activity. It may, it may also be that a new 
infrastructure supporting physical activity um, mostly attracts individuals who are already very physically active. And therefore, there's very little opportunity for them to increase their physical activity level, and the new infrastructure has no effect. Environmental interventions may all ha also have unexpected effects, such as the negative effects um, I just mentioned in boys aged 13 and over in the Moving to Opportunity study, or the potential selective migration in the urban regeneration program in the Netherlands. And because of these unattended and perhaps unexpected effects, I would like to introduce the concept of complex adaptive systems. Complex adaptive systems have a high degree of adaptive capacity, giving them, giving them the opportunity to resist external pressure or intervention or change. As a result of the behavior of the agents or actors within the system and the behavior of the system itself, certain patterns emerge that were not necessarily planned. Another characteristic is that a system, complex adaptive system, regulates itself through balancing and reinforcing feedback loops to maintain a certain equilibrium in the system. And finally, the actors and factors within the system depend on each other. When something changes on one end of the system, this may have an impact on the other side of the system as well. And mapping complex adaptive systems may help identify which set of factors continually reinforce socioeconomic inequalities in health, the so-called so reinforcing feedback loops. In order to identify them, the system needs to be mapped by identifying all relevant actors and factors and the linkages between them. For instance, this map of the food system identifies several subsystems which are interlinked, and with, within each of these subsystems, many factors are interlinked as well. And this is a more detailed example of where the researchers try to explain how the food environment especially affects low-income groups. So the authors mapped several subsystems within the food system and identified balancing and reinforcing feedback loops. So for example, in this example you see B1 and B2 and R1, the Bs are balancing feedback loops and the Rs are reinforcing feedback loops. So balancing feedback loop one describes how insufficient budgets for food can drive purchasing decisions which prioritize cost effectiveness, so low cost food purchases, and therefore reduce willingness to pay for healthier items which may be more expensive and cost-driven purchases of cheaper, energy-dense foods may actually enable financial management of the household and reduce financial strain. So this is a balancing feedback loop. But R3 is a reinforcing feedback loop. It reinforces itself, um, whereby limited health-driven purchases may reduce customer demand for a healthy produ uh, product. And reduce customer demand um, has an impact on the availability of healthy products in the local area and increases the cost of stocked items on healthy products. And in turn, if individuals perceive healthy foods to be more expensive, um, this further reduces the willingness to pay for healthier items that are more expensive. In addition to the concept of complex adaptive systems, I would like to introduce two other concepts that are relevant for systems thinking in public health. And I really need to acknowledge my PhD student, Cédric Middel here, um, who did all the work on this conceptualization. And the first adi uh, additional concept is the constellation perspective, which describes that a certain setting, such as a school, a hospital, a municipality or even a country has certain cultures and structures which determine how actors in the system behave, the so-called practices. Cultural th factors are things like values and perceptions, and structures are things like ICT systems, physical structures, but also power structures. While the cultures and structures determine individual practices, the practices in turn reinforce the culture and the structure. So if you want actors to change their practices, so for example, to make neighborhoods healthier, you need to address the barriers and facilitators at the structure and culture level. The third concept that is relevant for systems thinking in public health is the multi-level perspective. It describes that dominant regimes are situated in a landscape. Um, the landscape is not considered to be part of the system, but it's an external context in which systems exist and operate. 
and regimes are then um, stable and consistent. Uh, in, and within those regimes, we have the actors uh, performing practices, dominant practices, the way of doing. Then there is the niches. They often emerge at the fringes of the regimes as initiatives by few driven actors in response to perceived shortcomings or failings of the regime in meeting its associated societal need. For instance, regimes are supermarkets. They're working very successfully and they have a certain dominant way of working that makes sure that they're able to buy foods, sell foods and make money from it. Um, but niche level actors, for example, healthcare professionals or public health professionals, they may think this system is not working very well because it's actually promoting unhealthy food choices. So we want to change something. And you start as a researcher to, on the boundaries of the regimes, make changes. And I'll get back to these um, concepts later. So if you want to change a system so that a healthy living environment is possible and healthy living is easy and health inequalities are reduced, you need to make a transition in the system. Um, and there are different um, ways, uh, different steps through which a transition in the system is actually happening. So first, there is a punctured equilibrium. So the, um, the balance in the system is actually um, punctured, for instance, due to a war, the COVID-19 crisis, or a change in politics. So there's an external pressure on the system. And this creates an opportunity for a change. And actors in niches may then start experimenting. Um, and some of these niches may actually become dominant. And uh, after that, a new regime uh, arises based on the new niches and the system stabilizes. I will skip the pathways for the sake of time, but go straight to the Supreme Nudge Project as an example of how we try to change the food retail system in the Netherlands by conducting a niche experiment together with a Dutch supermarket chain. So in the Netherlands, there are large inequalities in food, healthy food intake and diet-related chronic diseases. Also, around 70 to 80 percent of the foods that people buy in the Netherlands comes from supermarkets. And the supermarkets are very unhealthy food environments. More than 80 percent of the products sold in Dutch supermarkets do not align with the Dutch dietary recommendations. More than 80 percent of the promotions and advertisements for foods are for unhealthy products. So it's very easy to make unhealthy choices in the supermarket and very difficult to make healthy choices. So our idea was, let's change the supermarket environment so that healthy choices become easier. And we co-created these supermarket interventions to make sure that after the end of our project, the supermarkets were actually the owners of this intervention and they would be able to scale them up. So we really wanted to create this win-win situation where through making supermarkets more healthy, um, we could promote public population health, but at the same time, the supermarket business could also still exist. So we started by talking to our target population, individuals with a lower socioeconomic position in the Netherlands, and we asked them about what drove their purchasing behaviors, but also how they would feel about getting some support in the supermarket about making healthy choices. And of course, there are many factors that uh, drive purchasing behaviors, and apart from people reporting to find health important. Um, things like taste, preferences of other family members, the cost of healthy food, um, but also just the ease of preparation, the convenience of foods was very important. And also the participants indicated that while they would certainly like help with making healthier choices, they were very wary of supermarkets offering this help. Why would a supermarket define what is healthy and what is unhealthy? Could they trust the supermarkets? And we thought this was a very valid point. So we decided that our interventions would not explicitly focus on healthy choices, but would focus on tasty choices, convenient choices, and choices popular with other customers. And of course, we, together with the Dutch Nutrition Center, decided what were healthy foods and unhealthy foods. But 
at the location of healthy foods, we would say, this is very tasty, this is very easy to prepare, this is a popular product. We then tested that in a virtual supermarket experiment, where we asked participants to do their grocery shopping in this virtual supermarket. And we tested what the effects were of nudges, um, so for example, signage in the supermarkets, having posters, having extra placement of healthy products, but also of price increases of unhealthy products and price decreases of healthy products, so taxes and subsidies. And we found that um, the combination of nudging and pricing strategies focused at healthy products would lead to an increase of 4% healthy products of all products bought. And this may seem like a small effect, 4%, but if the whole population would start um, purchasing 4% higher, um, uh, higher percentage of healthy foods, this would have a major impact on population health. But of course, this was a virtual experiment. So then we started discussing with the supermarket chain and many, many actors within this chain um, through a co-creative process, what would be possible to do in a real life supermarket setting. Um, and we learned from the supermarket actors what worked and what wouldn't work in reaching customers. And we really learned a lot because they see their customers. They know how to have a layout of the supermarket. Um, so we learned from them and they learned from us in terms of what is known from the scientific evidence, um, what is healthy and what is not. And we went to, through various cycles of co-creation. Some things were pretty easy. So all the supermarket staff believed that um, highlighting healthy products or putting them in a prominent place that this would work because they would already use that but then for unhealthy products. So this was relatively easy. Increasing the prices of unhealthy products obviously was not an easy thing. We worked with one supermarket chain and if they would increase the prices of unhealthy products, they feared that the customers would just run away to other supermarket chains that are also part of the broader food system, but did, did not go along with this niche experiment that we were doing. In the end, we had one very passionate director of the supermarket chain who agreed that we could test this. Um, so we went along and had price increases and decreases. So we did a randomized, a cluster randomized control trial with 12 supermarkets in the Netherlands, where six of them were exposed to nudging and pricing interventions, and six were, ex were actually control supermarkets where we didn't change anything. And in the supermarkets, we made sure there were additional placements of healthy products to make sure that the um, number of healthy products in the supermarket was actually increasing a bit. We used um, labels, signage, posters, etc., to make sure that the healthy products were more visible and more attractive. We used explanations of the three nudging teams, for example, on the, the bar of the supermarket cart, um, and we used the pricing strategies. And these are some of the examples of what the um, nudging and pricing interventions looked like in the supermarket. And by the way, these signage was designed by the supermarket chain because we wanted them to be able to use it after the intervention um, stopped. Um, there should have been a bit more symbols here. But anyway, um, we used a number of different outcomes. So we had a questionnaire on lifestyle behaviors. We used loyalty cards to have an indication of what people purchased. Um, we had a food frequency, questionnaire, uh, qu food frequency questionnaire to measure dietary intake. We had um, blood measurements, so HbA1c and lipid profile. We had people use a step counter app and people measured their waist circumference. And the dietary intake was um, our primary outcome. And I have to say, these were all, all at home measurements due to the COVID-19 crisis, which had a major impact on this experiment. The effects were very disappointing. So there is no effect whatsoever on the diet quality of the intervention participants. Um, and also not on the other outcomes, I should say. So none of the outcomes had, were favorable. But I need to mention the implementation fidelity briefly here. So these are the different supermarkets where we implemented um, the interventions. Um, <clears throat> you see the yellow one, this, this supermarket did notoriously bad, um, but none of them actually ever reached full implementation of any of the intervention components. 
And this is partly due to the COVID crisis, the staff shortage, um, everything that had to do with that, but also it had to do with systemic barriers in the supermarket system and the food retail system itself that repeatedly kept making it very difficult to implement the changes that we actually co-created with the supermarkets. But there were so many forces um, that affected the implementation uh, that we need to take this into account. So what are the implications of this um, also very expensive and uh, five-year project? So this was a niche experience within um, a regime, the food regime within the food system. And we were unable to change through this niche experiment to change behaviors and health. So the implementation fidelity I just showed was pretty low, but the intervention dosage was also relatively low. So we were promoting healthy foods in the supermarket, but with 80% of the products being unhealthy, we were you know, um, running against the tide a bit. So unhealthy cues in the food environment are still much more prevalent. And in the upscaling um, activities that we did with policymakers, other food retailers, other actors in the broader food system, um, we realized that for this um, problem, we really need a level playing field for the retailers. So the government should step in and say, this is the maximum number of promotions for unhealthy foods you can have. This is a sugar tax that you should implement. This is, you know, any number of uh, policies that make sure that all the retailers have to adhere to it. And it's not just one retailer sticking out their necks, because if it's just one retailer who has to start this movement, it's way too much of a business risk to make considerable changes that actually affect population health. So policies may really be necessary to incentivize retailers to change. But then my last point, and this is obviously also related to the conclusions of this study, is that there's only so much you can do at the local level. We tried with the supermarkets at the local level, um, but we couldn't make enough change. And this is a, uh, a figure from Boyd Swinburne, which is published in The Lancet, that shows the drivers and the environmental factors and the behaviors that determine the risk of obesity. Um, and I've been talking about environmental, what is called here moderators, environmental factors at the neighborhood level. Obviously, that's an important driver of behaviors and health, but there's something behind the neighborhoods. There's, there are parts of the system, systemic drivers that determine what our neighborhoods look like. And we need to address both, both at the local level and at the national and actually global level. So just to reiterate the take home messages, unhealthy neighborhoods do contribute to health inequalities. It's theoretically plausible that neighborhood interventions are more equitable than individual level interventions, but we definitely need more evidence on this. And it may be very helpful to take the systems approach to understand what is a sustainable way to create healthier neighborhoods so that the there are actually effects, there is an impact, but also the changes are sustained over time, regardless of, say, political situations. And finally, there's only so much you can do at the local level. I'd like to thank my team members from the Upstream team, and of course, all of you for your attention. Thank you so much. fascinating lecture. Um, I'm thinking about my neighborhood and most of the sidewalks they are for cars, not for people. So, and we are talking in the health system about the social determinants of health, about health in all policies. And I think it's also important to think about health in all policies in the local level. So this is one of the challenges and I know that the Minister of Health is going this way in Israel. So we have time for questions if you want to ask something. Yossi. Hey, you just get the mic. Thank you. Uh, I just, so maybe it's back to agency. Uh, maybe the conclusion should be that the leverage would be through agency rather than through envi environmental factors. Is this microphone working? 
Okay, good. Thank you for that uh, um, thought-provoking question. Um, I do think that we have tried um, interventions that are high, highly agentic interventions, so educating people, um, promoting health through mass media campaigns for decades. And that has had, first of all, not much effect on population health, but more importantly, it has widened inequalities and certainly not reduced inequalities. So I would not recommend to use highly agentic interventions to reduce health inequalities. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. I'd like to know if um, your team has discussed that on the other hand, besides poverty, that in a way people can be too wealthy. Uh, for example, in Israel, 30 years ago, people lived in very small apartments. Kids used to come home, throw down their bags, go out to play soccer. Now, a lot of these same kids are coming home to bigger houses, with a lot of tech, they're not going out, and I think that there's been at least a 40% in increase in childhood obesity, along with the fact that in certain neighborhoods now, there are so many fast food stores. Um, for example, even in my small neighborhood, in a small suburb, there are seven places to eat at a new local center, and maybe one is slightly healthy. That's it, and I, I really feel that that has an impact on on, chi on children and on development, and, and it leads to obesity throughout life. Thank you, and that is a very important point, because the food environment, the food retailers that people encounter in their local neighborhoods, part of them are maybe local shops and stores, but a large majority of them are part of national or even global chains. And this is something that needs to be addressed at a national or global level. Um, there's so much evidence for the influence on, of the food industry on obesity rates and type 2 diabetes rates. Um, this, is, this aspect of the commercial determinants of health along with the tobacco industry, alcohol industry, gambling industry, but the food industry is definitely something that needs to be addressed. And I think as we showed within the Supreme Nudge project, it's very difficult to do that at a local level because the local food retailers are part of a wider system that incentivizes so much to sell a very large bulk of unhealthy cheap food that it's just very difficult to change that from below. Um, but this is definitely an area where much more policy is needed. Hi, and thank you so much for a fascinating lecture. Um, I wanted to ask, so modeling studies do find um, environmental interventions to have positive health implications. Environmental interventions of the type that you were uh, discussing. And you showed that the experimental studies don't find that. So I'm trying to understand um, why, why is the gap? Do you, you um, think it's only because of the difference bet between local and um, overall policies of country? Or is it for other reasons? And in addition, as far as I know, some, some interventions, or not necessarily interventions, but comparisons between neighborhoods, like more walkable and less walkable, do see health um, differences. So I'm not entirely sure why your conclusion was that, that the, um, the interventions um, aren't, that we don't have any evidence that interventions don't work. Thank you. And let me start by the last question. So definitely there is evidence that um, people in more walkable neighborhoods, they walk more, they cycle more, they're more active, and they have lower, say, obesity rates, type 2 diabetes rates. So from those observational studies, there's definitely evidence that there is an association between 
the neighborhood design and health outcomes. The problem is when we try to replicate these associations in experimental studies, which of course are very challenging when you're talking about environments and randomization at the environment level, but those randomized studies, they cannot show these effects. Generally, obviously there are some exceptions. One of the explanations, and this is going to your first question for that, is that the study designs were traditionally using in epidemiology as the golden standard. So the randomized control trial is meant to find the effect of one intervention versus one control and expecting that this is a linear effect on the outcome. In real life, with a real life environment, that's not how effects go. And that's why I think we need this more systemic approach where we account for non-linear associations, unintended and unexpected effects on maybe the other side of the system. And that also means that we need different study designs to study those questions. Because I would say that the randomized controlled trials do not give, it, give us the insight that we want. Also because they don't allow for differences between subgroups and differences between contexts, the variation that we're interested in. And they're all like reduced um, in, in randomized controlled trials. So I do believe that by making neighborhoods healthier, we can make an impact on population health and perhaps reduce health inequalities, but we need a broader approach, including different research methods. Thank you very much. Last question. Hi. So, um, some of the proposed interventions we discussed, uh, things like improving walkability, shade, outdoors leisure um, opportunities, and, and so forth, are, are generally just good quality of life improvements for the said neighborhoods. So, my question is from like an empirical or even theoretical perspective, has there been any research into the possible adverse effects of that? vis-a-vis -vis gentrification, displacing the population we're trying to help? Yes, yeah, so first of all, there's the uh, effect that improving neighborhoods increases the value of neighborhoods and drives away the old poor population. And we didn't see effects for that in the one study I mentioned, but there are effects from other studies that show that um, selective regeneration or improvement of neighborhoods may actually drive away the original inhabitants and therefore making no change for those inhabitants. So it is a bit risky to do something very locally um, without looking at the impact of people who are moving away from the area. Um, I'm just trying to remember what your, the rest of your question was about. No? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Renta. It was fascinating and with a lot of thoughts about what we need to do here in Israel, also in the local level, not only in the government level. Thank you very much. Thank you.